For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some, some poisoned, poisoned by, by their, their wives, wives some, some sleeping killed, all murdered. Or within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king, keeps death his court. And there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene, to monarchize, be feared, and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh which walls about our life were brass impregnable. And humoured thus comes at the last and with a little pin bores through his castle wall. And farewell, king. It is more than 10 years since a major company in New York has performed Shakespeare's Richard II. At last, at the Brooklyn Academy of Music last Wednesday, the Royal Shakespeare Company has opened an impeccable and very contemporary production of this first of Shakespeare's history plays, the one richest in poetic imagery. Richard II has always been played as a sticky, sentimental, romantic king, and his usurper, Bullingbroke, as a conventional villain, simplistic representations of the good and the bad. Departing from this tradition, John Barton, the director of this production, has attempted to put the play into a new and more relevant focus, stressing not so much the differences between the king and his usurper, but their similarities. Barton has attempted to show that kings, in fact, all politicians, are actors, and the court, in Shakespeare's words, a woeful pageant, a tournament in which opponents endlessly struggle for power. In this interpretation, the crown is indeed hollow, and the course of history a cruel cycle. History is like a grand staircase upon which rulers climb up to power and then crawl down to defeat. One day it's Richard, the next day Bullingbroke. Kings are acting out their inevitable roles in a dangerous but compelling contest for supremacy. Extending the analogy between king and actor, and taking as his justification Richard's remarks that he and Bullingbroke are like two buckets in a well, Barton has cast two actors who alternate each night in the main roles, Richard Pascoe and Ian Richardson. This device adds a provocative ambiguity to the characterizations. But though the performances may be different, the struggle for power remains the same. The theatricality of kingship is further carried out through a mixture of theatrical effects. Designed with a master's eye for classical symmetry and Elizabethan pageantry, even with a strong sense of ritual, Barton has utilized stunning visual metaphors. On stage are two steel escalators, the staircase of history, reaching up to the heavens, as it were, connecting them as a huge sliding bridge that will rise and descend as the king's fortunes rise and decline. Downstage, on a pedestal, on what looks like a scarecrow stick, sits a shimmering gold cloth topped by the English crown. To the sound of drums, a procession of men, dressed in identical brown jerkins and brown boots, enter. The two main actors, Richardson and Pascoe, are on opposite sides of the line. They meet downstage, and as in a charade, they decide who shall play the king.
Now the play begins. The year is 1398. Richard is already on the throne, but his reign has not been very popular. He has antagonized the nobles by banishing Bullingbrook, his cousin, and a powerful political competitor. When Bullingbrook's father, Gaunt, dies, Richard seizes the dead man's property, which legally belongs to the banished Bullingbrook. This so infuriates the ambitious lords that they, together with Bullingbrook, who secretly has returned from exile, organize an insurrection to depose the king. In the meanwhile, Richard has gone to Ireland to suppress an uprising there. Upon his return, he learns that Bullingbrook's rebellion is taking hold. He calls upon the very earth to rise up in the defense of the true anointed king. I weep for joy to stand upon my kingdom once again. Dear earth, I do salute thee with my hand. The rebels wound thee with their horses' hooves. As a long-parted mother with her child plays fondly with her tears and smiles in meeting. So weeping, smiling, greet I thee, my earth. Feed not thy sovereign's foe, my gentle earth, nor with thy sweets comfort his ravenous sense, but let thy spiders that suck up thy venom and heavy-gated toads lie in their way, doing annoyance to the treacherous feet which with usurping steps to trample thee, yield stinging nettles to mine enemies, and when they from thy bosom pluck a flower, guard it, I pray thee, with a lurking adder. Mock not, my senseless conjuration lords. This earth shall have a feeling, and these stones prove armed soldiers ere her native king shall falter under foul rebellion's arms. But see, my lord, that we are too remiss, whilst Bullingbrook, through our security, grows strong and great in substance and in power. Yes, comfortable cousin. No, it's not that when the searching eye of heaven is hid behind the globe and lights the lower world, then thieves and robbers range abroad unseen. But when from under this terrestrial ball he fires the proud tops of the eastern pines, then murders, treasons, and detested sins stand bare and naked, trembling themselves. So when this thief, this traitor, Bullingbrook, who all this while hath reveled in the night whilst we were wandering with the Antipodes, shall see us rising in our throne the east, his treasons will sit blushing in his face, not able to endure the sight of day. Not all the water in the rough root sea can wash the balm off from an anointed king. The breath of worldly men cannot depose the deputy elected by the Lord. For every man that Bullingbrook hath pressed to lift shrewd steel against our golden crown, God for his Richard hath in heavenly pay a glorious angel. Then if angels fight, weak men must fall, for heaven still guards the right. Bolingbroke has teamed up with the powerful Northumberland, and together they've captured an important bastion, Bristol Castle. There they've executed two of Richard's most trusted men. When Richard hears this, he becomes despondent and has a premonition of his own doom. Let's talk of graves, of worms, and epitaphs. Make dust our paper, and with rainy eyes, right sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Let's choose executors and talk of wills, and yet not so. For what can we bequeath, save our deposed bodies to the ground? Our lands, our lives, and all are Bullingbrooks. And nothing can we call our own but death, and that small model of the barren earth that serves as paste and cover to our bones. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings, how some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered, For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court 
And there the antique sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene, to monarchize, be feared, and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh which walls about our life were brass, impregnable. And humoured thus comes at the last, and with a little pin bores through his castle wall. And farewell, king. Cover your heads and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form, and ceremonious duty. For you have but mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you. Feel want. Taste grief. Need friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me, I am a king? At Flint Castle, Bolingbroke and Northumberland finally confront Richard. Bolingbroke claims that he wants only his lands back and his banishment repealed. The king acquiesces to his demands, but in capitulating to Bolingbroke, Richard knows that it's just another step to being deposed. In this and the following scenes, Pasco and Richardson will alternate the role of Richard. He who wears the golden cloak plays the king. We are amazed. And thus long have we stood to watch the fearful bending of thy knee, because we thought ourselves thy lawful king. And if we be, how dare thy joints forget to pay their awful duty to our presence? If we be not, Show us the hand of God that hath dismissed us from our stewardship. For well we know, no hand of blood and bone can grip the sacred handle of our scepter unless he do profane, steal, or usurp. And though you think that all, as you have done, have torn their souls by turning them from us, and we are barren and bereft of friends, yet know, my master, God omnipotent, is mustering in his clouds on our behalf armies of pestilence and they shall strike your children yet unborn and unbegot that lift your vassal hands against my head and threat the glory of my precious crown. Tell Bullingbroke, for yon methinks he stands, that every stride he makes upon my land is dangerous treason. He has come to open the purple testament of bleeding war. But ere the crown he looks for live in peace, ten thousand bloody crowns of mother's sons shall ill become the flower of England's face, change the complexion of her maid pale peace to scarlet indignation, and bedew her pasture's grass with faithful English blood. Oh God, oh God, but ere this tongue of mine that laid the sentence of dread banishment on yon proud man should take it off again with words of sooth. Oh, that I were as great as is my grief, or lesser than my name, or if I could forget what I have been, or not remember what I must be now. Swell'st thou. Proud heart, I'll give thee scope to beat, since foes have scope to beat both thee and me. What must the king do now? Must he submit? The king shall do it. Must he be deposed? The king shall be contented. Must he lose the name of king? A God's name, let it go. I'll give my jewels for a set of beads, my gorgeous palace for a hermitage, my gay apparel for an armsman's gown, my figured goblets 
for a dish of wood, my scepter for a palmer's walking star, my subjects for a pair of carved saints, and my large kingdom for a little grave, a little, little grave, an obscure grave. Or I'll be buried in the king's highway, some way of common trade, where subjects' feet may hourly trample on their sovereign's head. For on my heart they tread now whilst I live, and buried once, why not upon my head? My lord, in the base court he doth attend to speak with you, and it please you to come down. Down, down I come like glistering Phaeton, wanting the manage of unruly jades in the base court. Base court, where kings grow base to come at traitors' calls and do them grace. In the base court, come down. Down, court. Down, king. For night owls shriek. Where mounting larks should sing. Stand all apart. And show fair duty to his majesty. My gracious lord. Fair cousin, you debase your princely knee to make the base earth proud with kissing it. Up, cousin, up. Your heart is up, I know, thus high at least, although your knee below. My gracious lord, I come but for mine own. Your own is yours, and I am yours, and all. So far be mine, my most redoubted lord, as my true service shall deserve your love. Well, you deserve. They will deserve to have that know the strongest and surest way to get. Set on towards London, cousin, is it so? Yea, my good lord. Then I must not say no. In the deposition scenes, all the themes coalesce. As Richard relinquishes the crown and looks into a mirror, one wonders if he finally sees the difference between the king as actor and the king as man, between real power and the illusion of power. What is, after all, the true face of a king or the true value of power? Alack! Why am I sent for to a king before I have shook off the regal thoughts wherewith I reigned? I hardly yet have learned to insinuate, flatter, bow, and bend my knee. Give sorrow leave a while to tutor me to this submission. Yet I will remember the favors of these men. Were they not mine? Did they not sometime cry, all hail to me? So Judas did to Christ. Yet he in twelve found truth in all but one. I in twelve thousand, none. God save the king. Will no man say amen? Am I both priest and clerk? I then, amen. God save the king, although I be not he. And yet, amen if heaven do think him me. Give me the crown. Here, cousin. Seize the crown. Here, cousin. On this side, my hand, and on that side, thine. Now, is this golden crown like a deep well, owing two buckets filling one another? the emptier ever dancing in the air, the other down, unseen and full of water. That bucket down and full of tears am I, drinking my griefs while you mount up on high. I thought you had been willing to resign. My crown I am, but still my griefs are mine. You may my glories and my state depose, but not my griefs. Still am I king of those. Part of your cares you give me with your crown. Your cares set up do not pluck my cares down. 
My care is loss of care by old care done. Your care is gain of care by new care won. The cares I give, I have, though given away, they tend the crown. Yet still with me they stay. Are you contented to resign the crown? I, no, no I, for I must nothing be. Therefore no, no, for I resign to thee. Now mark me how I will undo myself. I give this heavy weight from off my head. And this unwieldy scepter from my hand. The pride of kingly sway from out my heart. With mine own tears I wash away my balm. With mine own hands I give away my crown. With mine own tongue deny my sacred state. With mine own breath, release all duteous oaths, all pomp and majesty, I do forswear. My acts, decrees, and statutes I deny. God pardon, all oaths are broke to me. God keep all vows unbroke are made to thee. Make me that nothing have with nothing grieved. And thou with all pleased that hast all achieved. Long mayst thou live in Richard's seat to sit. And soon lie Richard in an earthy pit. God save King Henry and King Richard says and sent him many years of sunshine days. Good king, great king, and yet not greatly good. And if my word be sterling yet in England, let it command a mirror hither straight, that it may show me what a face I have, since it is bankrupt of his majesty. Go, one of you, and fetch a looking glass. Give me that glass. And therein will I read. No deeper wrinkles yet? Hath sorrow struck so many blows upon this face of mine and made no deeper wounds? Oh, flattering glass, like to my followers in prosperity, thou dost beguile me. Was this face the face that every day under his household roof did keep 10,000 men? Was this the face that like the sun did make beholders wink? Is this the face which faced so many follies that was at last outfaced by Bullingbrook? A brittle glory shineth in this face. As brittle as the glory is the face! For there it is, cracked in an hundred shivers. Mark, silent king, the moral of this sport. As soon my sorrow hath destroyed my face. The shadow of your sorrow hath destroyed the shadow of your face. Say that again. The shadow of your sorrow hath destroyed the shadow of your face. Let's see. It is very true. My grief lies all within. These external manner of lament are merely shadows to the unseen grief that swells with silence in the tortured soul. 
There lies the substance. And I thank thee, King, for thy great bounty that not only gives to me cause to wail, but teachest me the way how to lament the cause. I'll beg one boon, and then be gone, and trouble you no more. Shall I obtain it? Name it, fair cousin. Fair cousin? I am greater than a king. For when I was a king, my flatterers were then but subjects. Being now a subject, I have a king here to my flatterer. Being so great, I have no need to beg. Yet ask. And shall I have? You shall. Then give me leave to go. Whither? Whither you will. So I were from your sights. Go, some of you. Convey him to the tower. Oh, good. Convey. Convey as are you all that rise thus nimbly by a true king's fall. On Wednesday next, we solemnly proclaim our coronation. In the last scene, Richard is in jail, alone with his soul, the empty rim of the broken mirror round his neck like a noose. Dressed in a simple shift, he, like King Lear, will now become an accommodated man. And like Lear, Richard will wonder if it's better to be king or beggar, or simply to be content with being nothing. In jail, Richard's fate is sealed. He is murdered and no longer a threat. But Bolingbroke, now King Henry IV, feels guilty and seeks expiation in the Holy Land. But he never gets there. No sooner is he on the throne than the wheels of history turn, and shortly Henry IV will moan, heavy is the head that wears the crown. As he had turned on Richard, his friends will turn on him. And so the bloody civil war, the War of Roses, that was to rack England is already brewing. The stage is set for yet another gigantic slaughter that will be the subject of Shakespeare's Henry IV and Richard III plays. There, once again, the cycle will continue. Men will act out their roles as kings and usurpers, accusers and competitors, combatants and murderers in the irrepressible and unending struggle for power. All through the years, the Royal Shakespeare Company has sought to bring a revitalized Shakespeare to the public. This has meant a thorough re-examination of the Shakespearean plays in order to make them more immediate to modern audiences. It has also meant a rigorous search for new forms. Some of the results have been amazing. Peter Brook's Midsummer Night's Dream, Peter Hall's History Plays, and now John Barton's Richard II. The company has not neglected modern playwrights, however. They've premiered the works of Beckett, Pinter, and Genet, and more recently, a dramatization of the poems of Sylvia Plath, a work being presented by the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and one which we will present next week. In addition to their regular duties, members of the Royal Shakespeare Company lecture at colleges, and even now, while in America and playing at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, actors will be giving seminars at Brooklyn College. Such endeavors are not designed only to exchange new ideas, but to keep alive the greatest English writer we have, and to show his work in all its richness and complexity to new and young audiences.